Suck tunes, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you all had a preem new year. So, being that this is a hair loss channel, it should come as no surprise that I am a big advocate for 5 air inhibiting drugs like finasteride and dutasteride. If people tell me they are losing their hair but they haven't started finasteride yet, my suggestion will almost always be to start using finasteride right away. That should be a no-brainer piece of advice for anyone who wants to stop hair loss. It would be like if somebody told me they want to build muscle but they don't do any resistance training. I'd tell them they obviously need to hit the gym as soon as possible. Sadly though, it seems the suggestion to just start using finasteride isn't always so simple due to all the misinformation online. I'm not just talking about the rampant fear-mongering about the drug. I already have plenty of content talking about just that. Rather, it seems today that nobody has a clear understanding of where to begin with finasteride exactly. Let me be clear. The standard dose of finasteride that is backed by the most clinical evidence is 1 mg used daily. But there are a lot of people who will use less than that or take the drug with a less than daily frequency. Same thing with dutasteride. Some people will take it daily and other people will take it less frequently. People who are beginning the path of hair loss witchery deserve to know how often they should take finasteride, so it is about time I address this in a video. The question often is this, is it okay to take finasteride less than once per day? Like for example, maybe just once every other day? Or people may ask me something like if using 0.5 milligrams daily is the equivalent of using 1 milligram once every other day. Sometimes people ask that question because they think that taking finasteride less often may reduce the risk of side effects. But then the question is, does taking finasteride less often actually reduce the risk of side effects while maintaining its efficacy? A related follow-up question that is often asked is how low can you go exactly? Every other day, three times per week, weekly, or perhaps some other frequency. Well, hair loss witchers, it is time to use my witcher senses to find out if using finasteride less frequently compromises its efficacy or if it has any benefits maybe, such as possibly reducing the already low risk of side effects. To answer these questions, we first have to understand some concepts of what happens when we swallow any drug in a pill or capsule form. This is what's called the science of pharmacokinetics. It's actually pretty easy to understand. The pharmacokinetics of finasteride has been known for decades, and it is all summarized in this table here. So let's look at a few highlights of this table. First of all, finasteride is very well absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. Its bioavailability is 80%, meaning that 80% of the drug gets absorbed. If you take finasteride on an empty stomach, it gets absorbed faster than if you take it with food, about two hours faster in fact. However, that doesn't matter because you still get the 80% absorption whether or not you have food in your stomach. It is the amount of drug absorbed that matters, not how quickly it gets absorbed. So whether or not you're taking finasteride on an empty stomach, you will still get the full benefits of the drug, so don't worry about that. Finasteride has a large volume of distribution, which just means that it's absorbed into tissues throughout the body, which is good because we want it to get into the scalp and into the hair follicles. It does cross the blood-brain barrier, but it only has effects in tissues that contain the type 2 5-air isoenzyme. Finasteride specifically blocks the type 2 5-air isoenzyme and has no significant effect on the type 1 5-air isoenzyme. The type 2 5-air isoenzyme is located mostly in the skin, hair follicles, and the prostate. The isoenzyme that is in the brain is the type 1 5-air isoenzyme, so contrary to all the fear-mongering online, finasteride will not affect brain neurosteroid levels. And that's something I go into more detail in my series of videos on finasteride and neurosteroids that I'll link below. Anyways, the other number on this table that is important is the terminal elimination half-life, or just half-life, of finasteride. It is between 4.7 and 7.1 hours in healthy volunteers. It can be a little longer in older people, but as we'll get into shortly, the half-life doesn't really matter that much with finasteride. Before we get into that, maybe I should explain a little bit more about what the half-life of a drug actually means. We're not talking about the critically acclaimed first-person shooter released on the PC by Valve Entertainment in 1998. We're talking about the half-life of a drug because this is something that a lot of people have heard but still get wrong very, very often. To best describe what a half-life is, one half-life is how long it takes the level of a drug in the blood to decrease by 50% after you stop taking the drug. If you have been taking a drug for a while then stop it, in the time of one half-life, the drug level will go down by 50%. This graph shows what happens to the drug level after you stop taking a drug. The curve is not linear, so after one half-life, the levels fall to 50%. After two half-lives, it falls to 25%. After three half-lives, it falls to 12.5%, etc., etc. Practically speaking, the drug is essentially gone after five half-lives have passed. 
So in the case of finasteride, we know its half-life is only about six hours long. So if you stop the drug, it will be almost completely gone from your blood in about 30 hours. The half-life is important when starting a drug too. You get 50% of the therapeutic level after the first dose, 75% with the second dose, and by the fifth dose, you have reached almost 100% of the steady state level, meaning a stable drug level where the metabolism of the drug exactly matches the intake of the drug. Normally, Drugs are prescribed to be taken at an interval equal to the drug's half-life. This is to avoid periods between doses where the drug level falls below the therapeutic level. For example, normally you have to take oral antibiotics three or four times a day because antibiotics usually have a half-life of six or eight hours. The normal recommended dose of finasteride for hair loss is one milligram every day. So clearly we are already taking finasteride much less frequently than its half-life. So. Why is it that we only take it once per day, you may ask? Could it be possibly more effective if we were to use it once every six hours? Well, remember I mentioned that finasteride is widely distributed in the tissues of the body. It turns out it takes a while for the drug to accumulate in the tissues. Some studies looking at blood levels of finasteride indicate that it takes four days for the drug to accumulate in tissues and reach a steady state, while other studies show it can take as long as 17 days. So the implication here is that finasteride can stay in the body longer than its half-life would indicate, which would be one reason you can use finasteride less frequently than its half-life and still have it be effective. Even though it may no longer be detectable in your blood after about 30 hours, it is still in the tissues of the body, including the scalp and the prostate where it's active. The other reason you can take finasteride less frequently than its half-life of six hours is because of the prolonged effect finasteride has on the 5-AR enzyme, which is a much longer effect than its half-life half-life in the blood. Finasteride, it is a competitive inhibitor of the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme, meaning it binds to the enzyme and prevents the enzyme from converting testosterone into DHT. It is not an irreversible binding, but the binding does last a long time. When volunteers were given single doses of 10 to 100 milligrams of finasteride, DHT was suppressed 70% with 10 milligrams of finasteride and 82% with 100 milligrams of finasteride, which of course is a much higher dose than anyone would ever need to use. This this DHT suppression only took 24 hours to take effect, and remember, this is just a single dose. It took up to 7 days for DHT levels to return to normal after this single dose. Even a single 0.5 mg dose of finasteride decreased serum DHT levels by 50%, and the effect lasted from 5 to 7 days. When volunteers were given daily doses of finasteride of 25 mg to 100 mg per day for 11 days, all these high doses produced the same amount of DHT suppression. So. It's pretty amazing to me that people can take up to 100 milligrams of finasteride a day and tolerate that well, but that's clearly complete overkill. So the next studies use much lower doses. When lower doses were tried, it was found that 0.2 and 1 milligram daily of finasteride had similar effects on serum DHT suppression, and that these effects were greater than using doses of 0.12 milligrams or 0.04 milligrams per day. This finding was also confirmed in the study by Drake from 1999, which looked at both scalp and and serum DHT levels with different doses of finasteride. As you can see, significant scalp DHT suppression occurs even at doses of just 0.05 milligrams per day. So finasteride has a very flat dose response curve. What that means is that when you give low doses of finasteride, you quickly get to a maximum effect, and giving higher doses doesn't do anything to increase the 5 error blocking effect of finasteride. If you make a graph of the dose of most drugs versus its effects, you get a gradual curve that looks like this. However, if you do the same with finasteride, you get this graph here. You can see that the curve is very steep at low doses and then plateaus. So once you reach a dose of even just 0.5 milligrams per day, you get a pretty maximal effect, and going to higher doses causes just a slight increase in the effect of the drug. So the dose response curve is very flat at the doses that are normally used for treating hair loss. In fact, there's not much difference between even 0.2 milligrams a day and 5 milligrams a day in DHT suppression. I talk about this more in my video called The Optimal Dose of Finasteride, and I'll link that video below. However, the interesting thing about these multiple dosing studies is that it took 14 days for DHT levels to return to normal, regardless of the dose of finasteride that was used. So. With chronic dosing of finasteride, regardless of the dose used, it still takes a couple of weeks for the 5 error blocking effects to wear off when you stop the drug. So, it is clear that the biological effect of finasteride on DHT levels happens very quickly, even at low doses, and finasteride's effects on DHT suppression last a relatively long time, up to two weeks in the studies that were done on volunteers. So. 
If one milligram per day works to suppress DHT and 0.5 milligram per day suppresses about the same amount of DHT, it would make sense that one milligram every other day would suppress DHT as well as 0.5 milligrams daily. You could also conclude from the pharmacokinetics of finasteride that I just presented that even lower doses given every other day or less frequently would still work well too. It turns out we actually have some data from clinical studies that use finasteride dosing less frequently than once daily. But hold on a minute because I know some Somebody is writing in the comment section right now, but Kevin, if all these doses of finasteride have the same effect, then how come people have to take 5 milligrams a day for treating prostate enlargement, but only 1 milligram a day for hair loss? That doesn't make any sense, bro. Well, it turns out that the first clinical study of finasteride for prostate enlargement actually did compare a dose of 5 milligrams per day with 1 milligram per day. It's this article right here. In the article, Finasteride at 5 mg per day was only slightly more effective than 1 mg per day. In this figure here, you can see that the amount of serum DHT suppression from both doses was the same. You can see it as these two bottom lines in the graph that are nearly superimposed on each other. Also, if you look at the reduction in size of the prostate with these two doses, the reduction was almost identical as you can see in this graph here where the two bottom lines are the two doses of finasteride. The only reason why 5 mg was chosen was that there was a slightly greater improvement in patient symptom scores and in urinary flow with the 5 mg daily dose than the 1 mg daily dose. It turns out though that you probably don't really need 5 mg of finasteride to treat an enlarged prostate. As evidence for this, here is a study that looked at using half the normal dose for treating benign prostatic hyper Hyperplasia, specifically 2.5 mg per day, and compared that dose to the normal dose of 5 mg per day. The investigators had the dose of finasteride to 2.5 mg per day in 40 men who had previously been on 5 mg per day for at least one year, and then measured parameters of urinary flow. The results showed absolutely no changes in urine flow parameters on the lower dose compared to the standard dose of 5 mg per day. So, when clinical studies were done with finasteride for treating hair loss, it was realized by then that you really don't lose much, if any efficacy at all, by going down to 1 mg per day, and 1 mg a day was much less costly than 5 mg per day, especially at that time when finasteride was still under patent. So 1 mg per day was chosen as the standard finasteride dose for treating hair loss, but that brings us back to the question, is there evidence from studies that you can take finasteride less frequently than just once per day? Well. There is some evidence beyond the theoretical data I already presented on the pharmacokinetics of finasteride. In this study here, intermittent finasteride was used to treat not androgenic alopecia, but excessive body hair growth in women. Excessive body hair growth in women, also known as hirsutism, is caused by adrenal or ovarian abnormalities like polycystic ovarian syndrome that cause increased androgen production and increased DHT levels. It can also be genetic and caused by increased levels of the 5 air enzyme in the skin. It just further proves that DHT is a trash hormone in both men and women. So finasteride is often used to treat hirsutism in women, but the important thing about this study is that finasteride is given once every three days and compared to normal daily dosing of finasteride. There were 38 women in the study and half were given 2.5 milligrams of finasteride daily. The other half were given 2.5 milligrams of finasteride every three days. What's relevant to men with androgenic alopecia is that serum DHT levels were compared on the two dosing regimens. After after 10 months of follow-ups, the amount of DHT suppression was almost exactly the same in the women taking finasteride daily versus those taking the same dose every three days, as you can see in this table here in women with idiopathic hirsutism, and in this table here with women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Although the degree of DHT suppression was similar, there was actually a lower incidence of side effects in women taking the intermittent dosing schedule than the daily dosing schedule. So I think this study is pretty good evidence that the 5 air blocking effects that cause DHT reduction does last a few days with intermittent dosing, while at the same time, intermittent dosing might help reduce side effects in some people. However, Let's take a look at the other extreme on the intermittent dosing. It is this article here from Good Korea. In the study, 23 Korean men with androgenic alopecia who had been on finasteride at 1 mg per day for a year were enrolled. The men were divided into two groups and treated for one year with either 1 mg of finasteride per day or 1 mg of finasteride every other month. You heard me right, Chooms. Not every other day. We're talking about just once every other month. The subjects were assessed by the investigators after the first year of treatment. 
there were no phototrichograms done, which would be a much more objective measurement than just a global assessment based on photographs or clinical examination. There is also no mention of whether the study was blinded at all, meaning the investigators might have known which group each subject was in, and that may have biased their assessment of the results. I'll go ahead and just read the results right here. Quote, Two patients showed mild improvement, and six patients showed no change in the daily group. Five patients showed mild improvement, and seven patients had no change in the every other month group. There was one patient with aggravation in the daily group, and two patients with aggravation in the every other month group. Unquote. So the investigators concluded that taking finasteride at one milligram every other month was as good as taking it once per day, at least after the men had been on daily treatment of finasteride for at least a year. So like I said, this is just an abstract presented at a medical meeting. There is no peer-reviewed published research article to go along with this abstract, so this is just preliminary data. I know some of you guys have brought the study up with me thinking that it has some merit, but I'm sorry, I just do not buy the results here at all, Chooms. First of all, there was no control placebo group, so we don't know if the every other month group was really any better than the no therapy group at all. Also, the results were highly subjective since, like I said, no objective measurements like phototrichograms on the hair were done to back up the subjective assessments of the investigators. That's not a very good endpoint, especially when you consider that it isn't even clear if the investigators were blinded to what treatment the subjects were on, which could very much cause a bias in evaluating the subjects. Finally, this is a study of just 23 men, so it's a very, very small study probably too small to be reproducible. It also goes against the pharmacokinetics of finasteride that we already talked about. There would be long periods in between the doses where the DHT levels would go back to normal if you took finasteride just every other month, and that would be very likely to cause further hair loss regardless of what this study supposedly shows. So don't try every other month dosing at home, Chooms. That's just far too extreme. You might also ask whether dutasteride also could be taken less than once per day, and everything that applies to finasteride applies even more so to dutasteride. Dutasteride has a half-life of five weeks as opposed to just six hours with finasteride, and it is a stronger blocker of both the type 1 and type 2 5-air isoenzymes than finasteride is. Unlike finasteride, which suppresses serum DHT levels by about 70%, dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams per day suppresses it by about 90%. We already saw this graph that shows DHT levels take longer to return to normal with dutasteride than finasteride. So, intermittent dosing of dutasteride, even just a few times per week is likely to work well either as a standalone treatment or as an additive treatment to daily finasteride use. I already did a video about taking dutasteride intermittently. It's my video called The Perfect Dose of Dutasteride and I'll link it below. I also made a video about options you can take if you want to combine dutasteride and finasteride together if you want a little bit of extra DHT suppression and that video is linked below too. Bottom line though is that I think there is very good evidence that you can take finasteride every other day or maybe even less often, though I don't accept that taking it once every other month will work. Decreasing the dose of finasteride either by going to doses lower than one milligram per day or by not taking it daily will still maintain efficacy in most people while it may help reduce the risk of side effects. So I think that using one milligram every other day of finasteride really is as effective as taking 0.5 milligrams every day. This is based not on the half-life of finasteride, but on the fact that it has a prolonged effect on blocking the 5 air enzyme, an effect that lasts for days. Given this information, you may be curious and ask why I still recommend starting finasteride at one milligram per day. The reason why is because it is the dose that was used in most of the studies and therefore it is backed by the most clinical research. It is possible that if we had larger scale studies of finasteride done on lower doses comparable to what we saw with the FDA clinical trials for finasteride at one milligram daily, then maybe smaller doses would not be as effective. But I can only judge this based on the data that we have access to at the moment and this data is limited, but fortunately, the data does seem to indicate that finasteride doesn't need to adhere to an orthodox dosing protocol in order to still be effective. So, if you want to start finasteride at a lower dosage because you feel more comfortable doing so, then that's perfectly fine. It may even help you avoid a nocebo effect, but that's more of a psychological barrier than having anything to do with the actual drug. But let me conclude all this by stressing an important point. Whether you want to use the drug less frequently or at a lower dose is not what is important here. What is important is that you are just on a 5-air inhibitor to begin with. Whether you're using doses as little as 0.2 milligrams of finasteride every other day or all the way up to 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride 
cast dry daily, you can rest assured that you are doing what you need to do in order to get your hair loss under control. So what dosing protocol you choose to use is largely going to be based on your personal preferences, and that's something you can probably figure out with your doctor. Whatever you do, though, just make sure your hair loss stack actually includes a 5-air inhibitor. If you do that, then you can rest easy knowing that you have the slaphead curse under control. All right, I think that's it for today, so I'll see you all next time at Fellow Hair Loss Witchers. God bless. Thank you for watching.